Hello, and welcome back to the Advancing Healthcare Innovation Show. I'm your host, Michael Stamatinos. And if you're new to us, super excited to have you here because we bring incredible conversations with real leaders who are painstakingly shaping the future of healthcare. We're very passionate around access and leadership and innovation adoption. And if you're new to us and it's your first time tuning in, let me just tell you a little bit more about what we do here. So we're focused on bringing stories of innovation to life. And our aim is highlighting real people that are in the trenches, innovating within our space and giving them a platform to share their stories with the world. We've got an incredibly action-packed year planned with amazing new content, phenomenal interviews. And if you hadn't had the opportunity to look at any historical interviews, make sure you hit the subscribe button now so any new interviews come directly to you. Today, we're really excited to introduce our distinguished guest, Meg Noe. Currently, she's serving as the Chief Operating Officer at Amulet Nomeg. She brings powerful uh, dedication to technology coming from the lab into our hands, making the world safer and healthier. And she's been instrumental in the success of Allergy Amulet, a product designed to alert people to allergens in their food and Amulet Scientific, providing companies with technology to detect toxins at scale. She's not just a corporate leader, but also an innovator and an advocate. Meg has been a figure in driving awareness and support for individuals living with food allergies and intolerances. And Meg's commitment to making a positive impact in the healthcare realm is truly, truly inspiring. We're looking forward to diving deeper into her journey and her experiences and insights in today's show. Meg, welcome. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you. That was such a nice introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, when you give people an introduction, you got to do it right, you know. Um, so tell me a little bit about sort of you. Let's let's pause for a second, go back and kind of look at your history, because this is a very, very interesting and niche sort of area. We know that we all need food to survive, but there's this is sort of a different twist. Can you kind of maybe bring us up to speed on sort of what brought you here, a little bit more of your background, a little bit more color, and then we can kind of maybe dig into more of some of the work that you and your team are doing and have been doing for uh, the last few years. Yeah, so the, the past many, almost couple decades of my career, I've focused primarily in consumer advertising as well as product launch within the med device and pharma space specifically launching multiple first-of-its-kind technologies. Um, I also carried a bag, so to speak. Uh, I was in sales for both Pfizer and Stryker. Um, all that to say, about 11 years ago, when my first was born, she was diagnosed with life-threatening food allergies, and it completely rocked our world. We had no personal experience with it. And of course, my husband and I, both being type A firstborn, we were like, we're going to be the best food allergy parents there ever were. Um, so we cleared out our kitchen, we learned everything we could, and I kind of dove headfirst into the advocacy space, getting networked in my city, you know, meeting the right people, learning everything I could, and helping in any way that I could. And after a couple of years of doing that, I kind of felt this pull to do more in the space and take kind of my back background and do something professionally in it. So at that time, I left my career, I became what we call a certified aller coach, and that's a certification in the non-clinical side of food allergy management. So I worked with commercial kitchens, restaurants, schools, and individuals on best practices for managing food allergies. During that time, I met the CEO of my now company, Amulet, um, when they were just kind of coming into their first chunk of change and forming a food allergen detection device our, our first product slated for consumers and really felt this draw that my background in device and pharma and understanding that space and also my personal passion, it was just kind of this serendipitous pull in all directions. And so yeah. um, I've been at Amulet seven years now. Amazing. So you've been there you're pretty much from, from the, from the start. When you talk about your personal experience, how, how big is this issue around life-threatening food allergies i mean just how how talk a little bit about that because I, I have to be totally honest i'm i don't have i mean i have kiddos uh thankfully none of my kiddos have life-threatening food allergies so just talk talk about what what does that mean you, you talked about having to change things drastically can you maybe share a little bit more of uh from a macro perspective what that means yeah for sure i mean first i can talk about the audience in general if we look at america specifically one in 10 adults has food allergies and one in 13 kids. 
when you break that down, that's about two kids in every classroom, in every American classroom. So it's a lot of kids that it affects and a lot of families as kind of a trickle down effect. Um, in fact, one in four Americans, it's almost 85 million people avoid buying food products that contain what we call the top nine food allergies. And that is because there are closer to reactions in full, but the top nine are 90% of the time what reactions are to, and that's peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, wheat, eggs, milk, soy, and sesame. And when you um, say wheat, we can also lump in gluten as well. Um, so right. from that perspective, it affects a lot of people. Yeah, so, so tell me about how Amulet has decided to sort of attack this problem and how have folks been dealing with it prior to sort of Amulet's arrival in this in the space? So that's the biggest challenge is, you know, we're in the 21st century where technology is booming and there's still not a lot beyond once you're diagnosed with a food allergy, oftentimes your provider will say, avoid your allergens at all costs. Here's emergency medication that you need to carry on you just in case of a reaction and go. And 90% of your life is learning how to manage it, but there really aren't any tools out there to help you live that day to day. And I remember when my daughter was first diagnosed, I called one of my girlfriends that had a child with food allergies. And I just said, what am I missing? What, what am I not finding online? You know, what resources are out there? And she was like, you're not. Um, and so that's when, when I came across Amulet at kind of its infancy I knew that this was a tool that would be important for the food allergy community to add kind of another tool to your tool belt. It's not gonna replace what you do um, in the sense of diligence when you have food allergies, you'll still carry your medicines, you'll still talk to wait staff at restaurants, but to give you kind of another smart tool to be able to hopefully prevent you from having an allergic reaction. And then all of the things that go with that, like hospital bills, refilling up an effort, which can be really expensive, health scares, you know, mental health issues that go along with that. There's a lot. And so that's really our goal is to be that other tool you can add to your tool belt to hopefully prevent getting to that point. It's it's taking a more proactive approach um, while, while still also having the, re the reactive measures that you absolutely need, you know, in, in case something is life-threatening. Um, yeah, I've, I've had the displeasure of a family member, unfortunately, passing uh, because of an event where they didn't have their EpiPen, they were on a train. It was just tragic, tragic, you know, all the way around. Um, but but tell me a little bit more about sort of the focus, the solution. I know that you guys have been at this for a while. And when we talk about innovation, it's, it's really around, you know, being able to provide value to many and doing it over long stretches of time. I think there's this misconception that innovation sometimes needs to happen at a rapid rate. And you guys have kind of taken a little bit of a different approach. Can you maybe share the approach to how you've gone trying to innovate steadily over this stretch of time? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think there's also a difference when you talk about technological development. If you think about a software product, um, I don't wanna say it's easy to develop software because that is not the case but you can change things in more rapid time with a little bit lower of a cost. And so um, software development can go a little bit faster. When you're talking about a product like the Amulet, we have a software component with our app, but the majority of our product is a hardware product that takes a lot of iteration. It's very costly to develop, even just prototyping 10 Amulets can cost thousands and thousands of dollars and iterating on that. Um, so kind of the approach we've taken also knowing that the data that we're providing to people can help them make life altering decisions. We take it really seriously. So for us, it's not just getting a product out that works really well. It's also getting a product out that has been third party validated. So we have, um, other scientific bodies looking at our amulet and, and posting data and sharing white paper data on our technology so that we're not the only ones pushing that information out. It's making sure that we are IP protected and we have patents. So we have one patent issued and six pending. Our CEO is a lawyer by trade. And so, you know, that's always been really important to us is to really protect that technology, but it's also getting it into consumer hands and seeing how it goes. So for us, it was 
doing multiple rounds of beta testing with real consumers and friends and family and iterating on that. So this last round that we shipped out, we got a lot of great feedback from consumers and took the time to go back and say, okay, we need to make these improvements before we ship out our first blast because these really are going to affect the user experience. And we want to make sure it's not just the safest tool possible, but the best experience possible. And, and all of that takes time. Um, so, you know, at, at this juncture, we are slated to launch in 2024 and we're really excited about it, but we have taken kind of a methodical approach. It, it makes total sense. You know, sometimes when you go to market, sometimes you only get one shot and you'd rather get that right and, and be uh, measured twice, cut once and from in, in that sense. When you're, who's the ideal user? Let's talk a little bit about that in the audience. And if from an access standpoint, how do they, how do they use it? How do they, like, what does it look like from a use case situation? Can you maybe dig into that a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, you know, our ideal consumer, I would say the most common consumer we hear from and we see is a parent of a child with food allergies. Um, reason being when you have a child with food allergies, there are a couple things that make that challenging one, um, communication. So kids can't always communicate accurately when they're having an issue. I remember my, my daughter's first few reactions. She, unfortunately, one of her, the ways her body reacts is her throat tends to close. And so she had a hacking cough. I thought she was choking on a granola bar a little bit and then she got it down and she was okay. I later learned that that was her throat closing and she couldn't breathe very well, but she was one and couldn't explain that to me. Um, they can't read labels. And so as a parent, you, for the first several years, you are kind of managing that whole process for your child. So to have that extra gut check before they ingest any food um, that you know it's gonna be safe, I think that's why a lot of parents are like, I will take anything else I can get my hands on that's gonna help me wrap my head around it. Now, as they get a little bit older, they can read labels, um, you know, they can explain better if something's going wrong, if they're not feeling well, it gets a little bit easier, but then you hit the teenage years and then you kind of have another roadblock of, you know, will they carry their medications? Are they gonna be as diligent about reading? When they go to college, you worry. And so, you know, really, the amulet is for anyone that manages a food allergy or intolerance that wants to understand as deeply as they can what's in their food before they eat it. But I would say parents of children with food allergies are, are the people that we hear from most frequently of like, I've got to get my hands on this. Yeah, the network effect is really strong, especially with moms. And I can just say this with uh, my own children. The moms groups are very powerful in in many respects and they drive a lot of this decision making especially from from a health standpoint what what else have you learned or what were some of the surprises that came back from some of this initial feedback and maybe what are some of the changes that you didn't think you had to make that you're going to have to make for the future yeah that that's a great question i mean uh i would say the good news is that there was nothing that was mind blowing of, you know, how have we not thought of this? So that's really good. <laughs> um, but little things like, uh, so we have, and I'll actually show you, I have it in my office right here. Um, so we have two components for the amulet. One is the reader that's a one-time purchase. It can be worn as a necklace, a keychain, or on a wristband. Uh, I have it. Yeah, I remember when we first met, I was like, oh, that's a really nice piece of jewelry. And then you're yeah. like, oh, this is what it is. And all of a sudden you went into demo mode and I was I was blown away. Yeah. I was like, wow, uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's it is really pretty. I've worn it out and I've had people say same thing, like, oh, that's really cool. Tell me about that. And that's the best validation I can hear because yeah. if I can work it into my outfit and we're on vacation, great. Um, but like I said, we also have keychain and wristband options as well. So you know, a little bit of feedback on which variations would be the most popular um, on with our keychain, making sure there's um, kind of an easy to remove, but silicone case, because a lot of people are saying, you know, if my kid's putting it on the edge of their backpack or throw, you know, throwing it in their lunch bag or wherever they're putting it, we need to know that if we're spending money on this, it's protected, which is fair. Um, the other component of the amulet, um, 
So this is our sampler that is one single use disposable. You put a sample of your food in here, push this down and turn it to grind and homogenize the food sample. And then the other end of it right here, there's this chip that then plugs into the reader. And that's what we'll tell you on here if your allergen is detected. Now, a, a piece of feedback we did get with the sampler is to make sure that this has a tight locking mechanism because there was concern that, you know, it is single use with food allergens, even a minute amount, we can read in the parts per million range. So it's really important to make sure that consumers aren't trying to reuse this because then they're not going to get an accurate result if there's, you know, residue from a different food and then they're trying to test again. And so making sure this is truly, this locks and you can't reopen it once you put your sample in there. So some small things we've, we've iterated on, but nothing groundbreaking. Interesting. And, and when you say, I'll call it the, the, the things that, that are disposable, how often are they testing per day? I mean, is it each meal? Because I mean, I feel like that, that could add up pretty fast. Yeah. You know, that's a great question. And that's something we did, uh, third party market research on something else that takes time when we were getting feedback on design pricing, um, how people would use it, how often they would use it. What we heard from people is they would use it on average about four to five times a week. To be honest, we were pleasantly surprised. We thought that was higher than we expected. Um, but it's what really, were you anticipating? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think in my head, I was thinking two to three, but the tricky thing there is that it really is going to depend on the consumer. You know, there are so many factors of how severe, how severe is your allergen? How often do you travel? How often do you dine out versus eating at home? Because, yeah. you know, if it's a tried and true food at home, you might not test it. But if you're eating out nightly, you might be testing more often. Um, depends on your budget because samplers are single use. Uh, so it's, it's really, I think, going to vary per user. You know, one of the things that comes to my mind, and it might be that you guys haven't even addressed this, but in some of the underserved, overlooked populations, you mentioned some of the statistics around kiddos, especially ones that are in the underserved areas. How, how do you envision being able to make something like this that could be affordable for even those that aren't, aren't in the most sort of, oh, I hate to use the word privilege, but a, a position where they can get access to this. For, have you thought about any of that in sort of the mission, the vision of the company? And what does that look like today? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And it's something we talk about often because at this point in time, um, the amulet will be out of pocket. Some flex spending or HSA accounts may cover it. It's going to depend on the insurance company. But I think the long-term goal that will take a little bit of time to get to is, you know, with the amulet on the back end, we're able to capture data of, you know, all of the runs that people are doing, if they're detecting allergens, if they're not. So if we can kind of harness the power of that data and a little bit down the road, submit that to insurance and say, look how many allergic reactions we're preventing. That's not just healthier patients, but that's preventing you know, if they have to refill epinephrine, that can be $30, that can be $400. Um, we're preventing hospital co-pays and hospital visits, which is really expensive to insurance. And so I think that's the long-term vision is to be able to take that data and prove that we are truly preventing allergic reactions and keeping people healthier. Um, but again, that's going to take users really utilizing it, um, submitting that information to our app so we can kind of go that path yeah think about the the power of that and being able to mass all of those those data points together and what those insights could do down the line it, it can be it'd be pretty amazing when you're thinking about I, I can't help but think to go back to the idea that when you're designing something you're not just thinking of one particular persona because you mentioned adults you mentioned kiddos there's a lot of variables that are in between there. How do you decide during the design process where to go? Are you trying to cover the most amount of surface areas? So, so for example, the reason why I asked that is I think of some of the elderly population. I saw the way that you were opening it. So maybe dexterity, if dexterity is an issue, 
how, how do you navigate through that you and the team to the degree that you're able to can you maybe talk through that process yeah i mean a lot of it is um i, I think a couple of things one of them is messaging with our product so we we produce a lot of videos and content and social and email blasts of how to use things, best ways to use things, tips for users. So for example, on how to sample your food and we show different ways that you can do that. Um, we've talked with a lot of potential users and I say, I don't know if it's luckily, but a lot of our team have personal experience with food allergies. Um, you know, myself, my daughter has food allergies. I have several food intolerances. Our CEO and our software engineer both have nut and shellfish allergies. Um, so we get to be the best guinea pigs of how do we work this <laughs> into our lives? What, again, whether that's good or bad, we are our own best uh, test cases, I guess. Um, so a lot of it has been important to figure out making sure we're covering all bases of, okay, how would kids carry this? How would men carry this? Cause that was, you know, my husband's biggest thing was I can't carry a big case around. I don't have a purse. So, you know, if it's down to just, I need a sampler and an amulet, like what's the best way to do this here? Um, so kind of looking through every possible uh, user and trying to figure out ways that it can be customizable to your life and your lifestyle. Have there been some assumptions based on the feedback that you've gathered on who's who has the greatest propensity to use it? Is it male, female? What what have you learned from that? Or is it just all across the board? Um, I mean, it's definitely across the board. I would say in our market research, what we've seen is moms with kids school age at home are kind of our our biggest champions of the product. The moms that are kind of the ones managing their kids food allergies managing their outings and their lunches um so i would say moms late 20s to mid 40s seem to be the people that are are most interested and again it's not to say we don't we have users all across the board but that kind yeah. of tends to be the the sweet spot so let's just fast forward six months from now you've you will have hopefully have successfully launched what are what are some of the concerns that you have? I mean, let's just get real for a second here. What what are what do you think are some of these roadblocks in going to market? Because uh, there's there's a lot of folks that are all likely listening to this that are maybe are in a similar situation, about to launch, about to go to market. What what sort of what sort of things linger in your mind that you're like, man, we gotta we gotta really make sure we work through this. What are some of those things? Um, you know, I think one of the biggest roadblocks simply put is manufacturing. Manufacturing hardware products at scale is very expensive and that requires a lot of funding. Um, and so that's what we're working through currently. I will say though, um, one of the benefits to having taken a little bit extra time to get to market is that we've had a lot of time to create our packaging, run that by our beta audience, revise our packaging, send that to um, advisors of ours, allergists that are in the field, families that will be using it and get their feedback and iterate on it. And so, you know, work through messaging. We've done lots of A-B testing on messaging of what is most helpful to people to understand how to use the product and what it's not intended for. Just as importantly, I think that's a big part of my job coming in was making sure, you know, we're not just launching a product, we're really still introducing a product category. So making sure people understand its intent and what it's not intended for. Um, so I will say that's the benefit to um, taking a little more time is we're ready. I mean, I, I'm sure I know things will pop up that we haven't thought of along the way, but everything we can possibly dot or cross, you know, dot our I's, cross our T's, we've done. And it sounds like direct to the consumer is the route. How has the medical community sort of responded to what it is that you're doing? Because they could be very influential. You mentioned allergists, but I'm also seeing primary care, primary care, internists, family medicine. I mean, they, they have an influence over what happens. Have you thought about how you've engaged those particular influencers throughout this process? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's super important. I know for my daughter, uh, I have a close relationship with her allergist. And if I didn't know anything about the amulet, that's the first place I would go before I purchased one is to her yes. to say, 
have you heard of this? What do you, what do you think of it? Would you, would you recommend this? So we've kind of seen our place um, as, as an, uh, an education point for the, the physician community. Um, we have two of our advisors that have been early supporters and champions of Amulet are well-known allergists in the Boston area. Um, one heads up Boston Children's um, allergy program at, at Boston Children's. So really we've seen, we've done a lot of work on education. So that is an advisory capacity, but that's yes. also developing materials that we can share with them to educate them, but then also, you know, one sheets for their um, patients if they're interested. And also we see the importance of um, white papers and peer led in information sharing. So one of the things that we will offer is peer to peer calls. So if there's a clinician that's interested in learning more, whether it's, you know, ER, pediatrics, allergy, GI, nutrition, whatever that clinician specializes in, we'll offer calls with our peer allergists and advisors that really understand the amulet where they can ask their questions. Um, so we really see it as a, as a point of education at this point and, and partnership. So they are aware of the product and can confidently speak about it when their patients bring it to them. Yeah, because I can only imagine it being even a potential blocker. Imagine not having the support of the medical community in any capacity. That's, that's, a, that's a mountain to kind of climb over. But the fact that you've been proactive around it, have gotten buy-in, you know, through the importance of actually doing, you know, white papers. Are are you guys also submitting in for peer-reviewed journals and things of that nature to, to just even fortify it even more? Yeah, we have two published peer-reviewed journals. And then we also have um, partnerships with Dartmouth uh, or grants with the NIH, the NSF, and the USDA. So all of these steps we've taken are to further legitimize and, and validate our technology and what we're doing so that when we do take it to the clinical community, there are a lot of data points that they can look at um, to feel a little bit more confident in recommending our technology to any of their patients. But you're right, it, it could be a huge roadblock. And that's yeah. why um, also for, for them under making sure they understand the use case of we are not replacing anything you are yeah. recommending you are adding to that arsenal. Um, so that's just as important with the clinical community as it is with the consumer community. Yeah, even just thinking about this from a data play, would and, and can an allergist somehow review that data, review that information, intervene? Uh, you know, there's always that, that remote monitoring component, but you know, that's I'm sure that's something you guys have evaluated and it's down the line. Um, I know we're coming close to our time here. Just just give a little commercial for folks. How is how can they best follow your work? Um, I know you guys are really active on social. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? And then we'll wrap up with one other final question. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, one other thing that's been really important to us from the beginning is not just being seen as this product that we're launching, but also a one-stop shop for resources and education about food allergies. So if you go to our consumer site, allergyamulet.com, we have almost 200 blogs, webinars we've done, podcasts we've spoken on, and free resources like, hey, I was just diagnosed with food allergies. Here are the top 10 questions you need to be asking your allergist. And that is all on our website for free. Um, and then on there, you can also find all the links to our social. We are very active on social as well and, and have a lot of fun with that. And we'll be sure to put the, all those links in the description and make sure we tag you back as well. So if there's one ask that you have from our community, we're, you know, we're, we're a number of different influential leaders. What's the one thing that we can do to best support you and the Amulet team on your journey? Yeah, I appreciate that. Honestly, just spreading the word. I think that, you know, the, the biggest challenge that we have is that it is still a fairly new product category. So a lot of times I would say daily, I get emails from people in all caps that are like, how did I not know this existed? <laughs> and I think that's the challenge of letting people know we exist and that yeah. there is this option for managing allergies. And so spreading the word, because I feel like everyone knows someone who manages a food allergy or an intolerance or has a family member or somebody. And so just sharing that. Absolutely. So we're happy to do that. So for those that have joined in, if you found this content helpful for you, would you mind sharing it on your social media? Would you mind commenting? 
um, and even just blasting it out to your network. It makes a difference, especially as we're trying to advance health forward. And anytime you can bring innovators and doers together into a community to help for a really good cause, it's, uh, it's pretty fantastic. So Meg, I'm looking forward to potentially having you back on the show post-launch, hearing about learnings uh, and even some even some things that maybe didn't go the well that you wanted to. So appreciate you. Look forward to our next conversation. I would love that. And, and I would love to talk further about our commercial arm we're opening to, or we've opened to support uh, the food industry further up the supply chain. That's something we're um, just kind of dipping our toe in right now too. Awesome. Well, I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you.